Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to Sierra Metals Q4 2019 Consolidated Financial Results. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mike McAllister, VP Investor Relations. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sierra Metals year-end and Q4 2019 results conference call. On today's call, we are joined by Igor Gonzalez, our president and CEO, as well as Ed Gimaris, our CFO. Today's call will be followed, as mentioned by the operator, by a question and answer period. Today's accompanying presentation is available for download through the, both the website and from the company's website, www.sierrametals.com. Yesterday's press release and the financial statements and the management and discussion and analysis are also posted on the company's website. Before I turn over to slide three, before I turn the call over to Igor, I would like to indicate that this earnings call contains forward-looking information that is based on the current company's current expectations, estimates, and beliefs. This forward-looking information is subject to a number of risks, uncertainties, and other factors. Actual results could differ materially from our conclusions, forecasts, or projections as reflected in the forward-looking information. Additional information about the material factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from the conclusions, forecast, or projection in the forward-looking information and the material factors or assumptions that were applied in drawing a conclusion or making a forecast or projection as reflected in the forward-looking information is contained in the company's annual information form which is publicly available on CEDAR or EDGAR via Form 40F or on the company's website. Please note that all dollar amounts mentioned in today's call are in U.S. dollars unless otherwise noted. With that, I would now like to turn the call over to Igor Gonzalez, our President and uh, CEO. Please go ahead, Igor. Thanks, Mike, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I would like to take a moment to provide you an update uh, about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and how the company has been impacted today and the actions that we are taking to mitigate the risk to our workforce and the company. On uh, March uh, 16th, the Peruvian government declared uh, a state of emergency for two weeks, uh, and with that came a, a lockdown of the country plus a curfew for the population at night time. Uh, following these orders, we immobilized uh, plus 500 employees on the uh, 16th, and uh, we, we ordered every employee uh, from the administrative areas to work from, from home. Uh, we were able to keep uh, essential services crew at at our Yelby Cochamai. Uh, then uh, on March 26, uh, uh, the government also uh, declared an extension of the state of emergency for additional 13 days until April 12th. Uh, and uh, where we plan to get back to normal operating capacity. Permits have been also deferred until after the emergency. Uh, we have no cases of COVID-19 within our company employees. And uh, the essential services crew remains at the mine uh, following uh, our health, all health pro protocols of the Peruvian Health Authority and the World Health or Organization. Daily uh, medical checkups and no contacts with uh, outside personnel. The essential, essential services crews uh, basically are doing some support uh, activities on the uh, infrastructure at, in the mine, and uh, we are doing some maintenance, uh, some stockpile processing at the um, processing facility, and uh, some uh, content, on hand concentrate shipping. In the case of our Mexican operations, uh, last night 
the Mexican government declare a sanitary emergency in Mexico for 30 days uh, throughout April. So far, our operations in Mexico have been normal, and, and we're waiting for uh, official word of the government to uh, clarify whether our, our operations are included in this uh, uh, emergency or if we can continue to operate. So far, we've been operating uh, on a normal basis in, in Mexico. And of course, this is a, a very dynamic uh, situation. And now, uh, moving on to uh, slide number six. Based on, on the COVID-19 uh, update I, I just provided, and looking at our hours for the company, I would like to mention that due to uncertainty of the effect of COVID-19 pandemic, could have on our company's operations, financial conditions, and rapidly changing development, the company is currently implementing a proactive and reactive mitigation measures to minimize any impacts of potential COVID-19 might have on our people, communities, operations, supply chain, and finance. I should mention also that we have a, a crisis committee formed in each one of our minds, and we have daily calls to uh, make the, the appropriate decisions and uh, in order to cope with this uh, crisis. This also includes uh, the preservation of capital, uh, deferring capital programs where appropriate uh, to improve uh, liquidity. The company is maintaining its guidance due to its operating flexibility as our Yari Coach mine in Peru and the normal operations of its Mexican mines at this moment. If material changes occur, the company would update its guidance promptly and expect to provide a more comprehensive update, including most data points on metal prices and operating development as part of the Q1 2020 reporting process. Turning now to the highlights on slide number seven, we will now provide the highlights for the full year. 2019 was a pivotal year for the company as we completed throughput expansion and completed production ramp up at both of our Mexican mines. This provided for a significant increase in the consolidated production for all metals over 2018. Also, we recovered the tonnage that was lost from the illegal strike action at the Yaricocha mine in Peru. Uh, in Peru. In 2019, we faced a lower base metal prices and higher improvement and refining charges. As well, we realized increased labor and contractor costs, primarily related to increased development work, which was required to achieve higher throughput uh, throughout the year. Despite these challenges, the company generated a significant amount of operating cash flow, which have been allocated carefully and prudently, in order to fund capital expenditures and maintain liquidity. Furthermore, we continue to realize strong returns on the capital invested in our growth projects. Looking now at slide number eight, revenues from metals payable in 2019 were 229 million with 65.3 million of adjusted EBITDA but consolidated throughput of 2.7 million tons of metal production and of 112 million copper equivalent pounds or 19 million silver equivalent ounces or 268 million equivalent pounds 2019 year. We finished the year with a cash balance of 43 million. Turning to slide nine, you can see that on a consolidated basis, we had a year of solid operating performance with a 15% increase in the number of total tons processed and 
increases in all metal tools compared to 2018. The metals mix, a percentage of revenue, has been leading the way representing 38% of revenue, which is expected to continue and possibly increase in the future. This is followed by 25% from Fink, 19% from Chelbert, 12% from Lead, and 6% from gold. Turning to slide 10, and taking a closer look at each mine now, the auditor saw a 20% increase in throughput during 2019 versus 2018, as we continue to run the mine at higher throughput rates, working to successfully recover lost tonnage from uh, uh, the strike earlier in the year. Higher speed lead and gold head grades and higher recoveries of all metals resulted in a 43% increase in steel equivalent pounds produced during 2019 as compared to 2018. Cash costs of 46 cents per steel equivalent payable pound were lower at the uh, in 2019 over 2018, whereas the all in sustained costs were 8% at 79 cents per sink equivalent payable of pounds higher as a result of higher sustaining capital and an increase in steam treatment and refining costs as compared to 2018. Hi, Igor. This is the operator. Hi, Igor. Your line is a little choppy. Are you able to move closer to the microphone? Uh, is this better? Uh, a little choppy still. Hello? Uh, can you speak? Yeah. Well, this is this is the best I can do. I'm I'm, I'm at home, so I'm as close as I can get to the to the microphone. Is that better? It is a little better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Management continues to focus on cost reduction initiatives and their implementation at Yauricocha going forward. The Yauricocha mine continues to be a solid performer for the company. And we continue improving the mine with a focus on the expansion to 3,600 tons per day, expected in the later part of 2020. Work has been completed on the tailings of dam expansions and we are awaiting permits to commence production at the higher throughput level. However, Government processes related to permitting applications are deferred uh, during the state of emergency due to COVID-19, which may result in delays to the permits being issued. Work also continues on a run to connect the 820 level with the 720 level of Yarikocha, which will provide for an additional at least 10,000 tons per month of increased capacity to move forward and waste from the mine and alleviate the head frames. These projects will help the mine to run more efficiently and help to further reduce costs. Furthermore, surface drilling has commenced on, on high value targets such as Doña Leona and Victoria, where we recently received permits. However, this non essential exploration is being deferred to preserve capital until we have more clarity on COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, the Yauricocha Reserve and Resource Update was issued in December with a full NI-43-101 technical report filed in February 2020. Mineral reserve tonnage decreased 5%, which included mine depletion, Mineral classification improved as the proven reserves increased 45% and the probable reserves decreased 18%. Turning now to slide number 11, at Bolivar we had an excellent year realizing 23% increase in throughput, which was a record along with the record metal production, which included a 28% increase in copper equivalent pounds produced when compared to 2018. Bolivar realized a 11% reduction in copper head rates that was offset by a 46% increase in throughput, a 
59% increase in gold head grade and a 12% increase in silver head grade. Additionally, we were able to achieve improved copper and silver recoveries at the plant due to the significant plant improvements the company has made during the year. We expect copper grades to modestly improve in 2020 as we source more ore from Bolivar West zone, as this zone has higher copper, silver, and gold grades. Cash cost per copper equivalent payable pound increased to $1.73, and the all in sustained costs were higher at $2.86 in 2019 versus 2018. This is attributable to higher labor and contractor costs related to stop and run development within the mine to increase throughput. Additionally, sustaining capital expenditures were higher due to equipment purchases, mine development costs, exploration drilling, and plant improvements. Bolivar reached an average throughput of 3,628 tons per day in 2019 and is expected to ramp up to approximately 5,000 tons per day by the fourth quarter of 2020. An updated mineral reserve and resource estimate was issued today, March 31st, 2020, which includes drilling programs completed between November 2017 and December 2019, as well as production data up to December 2019 and represented a 5% decrease in mineral reserves tonnage Total indicated mineral resources increased by 48% in the 2013 technical report and 68% from the December 2019 update. Total inferred mineral resources increased by 268% from the October 2017 technical report and a 29% since December 2019 update. A NI-43101 technical report will be filed within 45 days. It's worth mentioning that the drilling occurred mainly at the Fierro Mine, or El Gallo Inferior, where the grade is typically no higher than 0 0.7, 0 0.8 copper in situ. Infield drilling is still planned for the Bolivar West and West Extension uh, and the Bolivar Northwest Zone which are considered high value targets, but which could not be drilled due to contractor delays in the development of these areas, which would have contained strategically placed in drill stations. These areas contain higher copper grades, up to 1.5% copper in situ, as well as increased gold and silver grades, which were previously reported. Subsequent infill exploration programs are planned and in these areas in the coming year with the goal of increasing tonnages and grades at, grades and at Bolivar. Also based on the large increase to the mineral resource, resources, the company is committed to updating the PDA for the Bolivar mine, which will provide us with a clear path forward to further potential expansions at the mine. The previous GEA recommended an increase of production to the 5,000 tons per day level by 2021, and we are very close to achieving that level of production. Turning now to slide number 12, in 2019, CUSI average throughput was, uh, CUSI average throughput was 1,815 tons per day, which was a 28% increase over 2018. The mill has the capacity to produce at 1,200 tons per day level, but due to the a subsidence at the mine and the need for additional development, the mine continues to ramp up to 1,200 tons per day level, which is expected to reach in, in the second quarter of 2020. The increase in throughput resulted in a 27% increase in silver equivalent ounces produced despite the lower hit rates and recoveries realized for all metals. Development delays due to the heavy rains as well as an issue with a subsidence in the third quarter required a 16 meter high pillar left in place to, for its stability purposes. As a result of the delayed development, lower grade zones 
that were accessible were mined, resulting in lower silver grades in the later part of the year. New contractors arrived at the mine site in October with a focus of improving development rates in the new areas and in stop access. We're also focused on the development on the, of, of the levels 1704 and 720 at the Santa Rosa in Lima to provide higher grades or for the mill. Work also continues, enlarging the ramp size to four and a half by four meters, allowing larger trucks to haul more ore from the mine to the plant. With this change, SCUS is expected to reach the 1,200 tons per day level throughput and become a profitable operation. CUSI cash costs for silver equivalent and payable ounce was $21.38, and the all sustaining cost was $30.89 for silver equivalent payable ounce, which was higher in 2019 compared to 2018. Unit costs were higher compared to 2018 as the slight increase in silver equivalent payable fund could not be offset the increase in cost of sales and sustaining costs during the year, which included higher capital expenditures at the mine related to additional mine development as a consequence of a ground subsidence event at the mine earlier this year. The company expects to have an updated NI43101 technical report for the CUSI mine at the end of Q2 2020. And it's expected to include the results for additional infill drilling currently being completed at the mine to improve the quality and classification of the resources contained within the NI43101 technical report. Terra Metals had a solid year with consolidated throughput and metals production and it's ramping up production in Mexico. We continue working to improve our fair share value, but in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're facing lower metal prices and un uncertainty in the markets. Management is on top of this extremely fluid situation, and the board and the management teams are consistently reviewing and adapting to the current markets. We're scaling back on non-essential exploration programs currently to preserve cash, but continue with certain program, programs with a goal to improve quality at uh, an additional resource. The company continues to have a solid financial position and the liquidity to support our operations and expansion programs, which always represents a prudent use of capital and provides for an excellent return on investment for the company and its shareholders. With that, I would like to review our cash flows for 2019 in more detail. Turning to slide 13, during 2019, our operating cash flows before movements in working capital were 66.4 million. We had negative working capital adjustments of 4.6 million. We paid 22.2 million in taxes. We invested 54.6 million in capital expenditures in Mexico and Peru. We spent 60. 0.8 million to repay loans, credit facilities, and on interest payments, and we also paid 2.8 million uh, report to shares of the company. We received proceeds from the issuance of senior credit facility of 99.8 million, leaving us with a cash balance of 43 million as at December 31st, 2019. On slide 14, the company is in good financial health and we maintain a strong balance sheet with $43 million in cash. Our total debt or $99.8 million at the end of Q3 2019 with a net debt of $56.8 million. For 2020, the company focus remains on cash flow and allocation and the allocation of operating cash flows to sufficient capital growth to provide funding for the remaining capital expenditures planning this year. Management continues to review metal prices and retain the ability to further adjust capital expenditures with respect to metal changes within the year. Furthermore, in a previous press release dated January 8, 2020, in anticipation of, of free cash flows during the year, the company was contemplating returning capital to its shareholders for which the company board of directors had approved a plan to return up to $30 million 
to shareholders during 2020, which represented a portion of the EBITDA guidance issued for 2020. However, due to the highly uncertain economic situation as a result of COVID-19 and its impact on the company's operation and metal prices, the company has decided to postpone the substantial issuer bid share for repurchase program. With that, I will now turn the call back to Mike. Thanks, Igor. That ends the presentation portion of the call. As mentioned earlier, uh, we would now like to open up the call to questions from participants. Operators, if you could please open up the line. Certainly, ladies and gentlemen. As a reminder, in order to ask a question, you do need to press star and then one on your telephone. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Your first question is from Heiko Ion with HC Wainwright. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions and hope everybody's staying safe. Thanks, Heiko. Hey, so on sustaining costs, this is a quote, in 2019, we're 8% higher at your Ipacha, 30 34% at Bolivar, and 40% at Kusi. Can you guys attribute this to higher cash costs, higher treatment or refining costs, and higher sustaining capex? I mean, can, can you break this down a little bit more? I mean, the, the 34 to 40% increase in all in sustaining costs, I mean, I would assume the treatment and refining costs are just a very small part of that. I mean, that's got to be a fraction. Can you just maybe try a little bit more color on these numbers that are, you know, reasonably high? Uh, hi, Heiko. It's Ed. Uh, thanks for the question. And uh, the, the all in sustaining costs, does contain a much higher treatment cost and refining cost. It, it's not uh, a, a de minimis amount. The, the increase from 2018 to 2019 was was uh, in the ballpark of uh, north of 50, somewhere between 15 and uh, and 20 million dollars. Most of that was in the zinc treatment cost. So very significant, and that. That affects your net smelter revenue, but uh, again, just goes all the way down, down the line, um, and affecting obviously EBITDA and your your cash. Can you break it out just a little bit more, maybe quantify it a bit? Uh, I don't have that in front of me right now, Heiko. But essentially, uh, there was sustaining capital uh, across across all mines, uh, an increase from where we were in 2018. Uh, but the, the significant impact was was the the TCs and RCs. Got it. Okay. And, and then just a clarification. Uh, you said you postponed the substantial issue uh, bid share buyback due to COVID-19. Um, do you plan on announcing when this postponement is lifted, and uh, do you think you might even revise the amount? And also, just to just to clarify, how much has actually been returned in Q1 under this program before this whole COVID stuff started to happen, please? Okay, Heiko. Um, uh, just oh, you want to take it, Igor? Go go ahead, uh, Ed, and then I'll complement. So j just starting with the the second part of the question first, nothing uh, nothing was uh, repaid uh, or repurchased in Q1. Uh, if you recall the the press release back on, on January 8th, I believe we were planning to to launch this substantial issuer bid uh, in Q beginning in Q2 of 2020. Um, obviously, the effects of COVID-19 have uh, have put this on hold for the time being, and uh, we're not prepared at this time to comment on when that could be uh, reinstated or, or uh, launched. Again, that's going to have to uh, depend on metal prices, uh, macroeconomics, to get us to essentially where we were to basically the end of, you know, into the fourth quarter of 2019 and, and the fundamentals at that time, which led us to 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 make the decision to to launch the share buyback program. So I, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to, to to be done in terms of the economy getting back on its feet. So I, I'm not prepared to, to 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 say when that might be. Got it. 
Thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, what uh, what we're doing, uh, Heiko, is uh, given that the realized uh, metal prices to date in 2009 and uh, 2020 uh, have uh, uh, been continually dropping. Uh, this is uh, this has uh, uh, forced us to put a team in place in, in Sierra, and and, uh, and we're reviewing different scenarios. Of course, we're reviewing first of all growth capital uh, to see if we can defer or, or or stop some of the capital projects uh, altogether for during this period of time. Uh, we're also reviewing sustaining capital. Operating costs, contract uh, administrative costs, uh, and uh, and also uh, all the contracts. So that work is, is ongoing. Each one of the mines has its own its share cut out for them, and and they are supposed to be reporting on a, a on a weekly basis. Uh, and uh, we are making the, the decisions in order to save. Uh, Capital and and reduce our our, our costs. So we, we will update the market uh, once we have all the, the scenarios uh, defined internally. However, you have to understand that uh, uh, Mexico and Peru are, are continually evolving in in, in view of this uh, pandemic. So uh, so far in Peru, we think uh, we're going to have, for example, a, a a shutdown period of uh, 28 days. Uh, we don't know yet if it will be extended or not. If it's not extended, then we'll go back uh, to operations uh, on April the 12th. If it's ex extended, we'll, we'll, we'll have to reassess. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Thank you. Your next question is from Mark Reichman with Noble Capital Markets. Your line is open. Thank you and good morning. Um, I think Igor may have answered part of this question, but when you talk about uh, trying to conserve, uh, you know, some, on some of the non-essential exploration, I think in the past you had talked about, you know, this Bolivar expansion going beyond 5,000 tons per day, uh, that that was kind of an aspirational goal and you kind of look at it, you know, when you get closer to reaching that target. And, uh, and so I was just wondering, in terms of where you try to conserve, uh, how much do you have a specific target in terms of hard dollar amount in mind, and 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 how much could be gained from uh, you know pushing out that expansion, you know, including maybe the PEA or whatever, uh, to trying to get Bolivar up above that 5,000 ton per day rate? Yeah, the 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 target is the scenarios that we're evaluating will give us that uh, target number. Uh, I, uh, I cannot give you that number right now because we're in the middle of the, of the evaluation. But yes, mm -hmm. we, we're considering first to defer a, any capital that uh, is non-essential at this point in time, although it was approved uh, earlier in the year. But for example, the Yalicocha shop, uh, we could mm -hmm. slow down its uh, implementation but we could also uh, make sure that we build the, the ramp, which will alleviate the, the Yavikocha shop. So that's the type of trade-offs that we're doing right now. Also, the, okay. the communication between Esperanza and Kachikachi the, at the uh, 10, 1070 level will also alleviate the Yavikocha shop. So those are the trade-offs that we're doing now. And if we see that those two projects alleviate enough the Yavikocha shop, then we, we can then slow down the Yavikocha shop. So those are the things that we're doing. In, in Mexico, or we're also, for example, uh, we were building a tunnel to communicate all the Bolivar underground works with, uh, with the plant. Uh, we have to slow down that, uh, that project, and now we're, we're very close to Stopping all, all work in that in that project uh, just because uh, we need to uh, uh, conserve some some capital. On the, on the flip side, I mean, are you seeing yet any benefit from the lower oil and and, and fuel costs, or 
I mean, how much sensitivity do you have to that in terms of, uh, you know, maybe offsetting some of these uncertainties in some of the other areas, at least through throughout 2020? Hi, hi, Mark. We have seen. Well, to, uh, the change in oil um, prices doesn't impact us, uh, diesel or oil. Uh, there, a lot of our machinery underground is uh, is electric, and the the amount would be less than than a uh, million dollars, if you will, on a entire okay. year. It's it's really the bigger bigger ones are obviously metal prices. And you do have a little bit of savings in terms of the weakening currencies, um, you know. But again, that that doesn't even come close to to the the impact on metal prices. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. The the the, the big part of our energy consumption uh, for both uh, Peru and Mexico comes from from the grid. And, uh, and of course, we have contracts uh, around those prices, so we don't expect to see any uh, drops in those uh, unitary costs, power costs. Okay. And your next question is from Lee Cooperman with Omega Family Office. Your line is open. Yeah, let me just first uh, compliment you on you know, your performance under very difficult circumstances. You know, you're doing a very fine job. Unfortunately, the price of the commodities are uh, undermining you. I'm just curious, without any specificity, do you expect to generate cash uh, during the course of 2020? Uh, I'm not looking for any specific forecast. That would be one. I have three questions. That would be my first question. Hi, Lee. Thanks, thanks for your question. It, it's too early to tell based on uh, the, this, the, the pandemic and how long it lasts. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're not prepared to answer that at this time. Uh, okay. I'm hoping we're hoping to give more clarity on our May call for our Q1 results. Gotcha. Uh, thank you. Second question. I noticed that the uh, exhibit that you used to include of the NAV of the company was omitted in this uh, slide deck. Uh, any particular reason, other than you didn't like the results? Uh, no, no. <laughs> It was it was essentially that that information was based on um, uh, information from 2017 in terms of PEAs, so that that's really become outdated. And, and now that we have NI 43101s completed at Yaracocha and Bolivar, and we'll soon to have an NI 43101 reserve resource on Kusi coming up uh, before the end of June of 2020. We'll, we'll be in a position at that time to, to assess updating PEAs and, uh, and then reinstating uh, that sort of schedule. Did you have a view as to whether that number would have been higher or lower uh, if you published it today? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to, to answer that to, today, Lee. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, lastly, what was yeah. the analysis that went through that – formulated the decision to uh, buy back stock. I, I, I think you did the right thing by canceling the buyback, but I'm just curious, what was the analysis that uh, was your conclusion that given everything you looked at, the stock was selling below the intrinsic value of the business and it was a good thing for the shareholders to reduce the cap? Is it as simple as that or was there something more subtle? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand. Lee, are, are you? Why were you motivated to buy back stock when you announced the? Were you motivated because you thought the stock was mispriced? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so, two reasons, uh, uh, Lee. Uh, one that uh, in our budget 2020, when we submitted to the board, uh, we we had a, 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 a uh, we were trying to. Uh, position ourselves uh, with a very good uh, cash cash position, and, and as such, we wanted to make use of that that cash. And uh, given the price of the stock, then we we, we thought it was uh, one of the best options to to buy back. Uh, uh, but that was uh, with uh, budget 2020. Since then, uh, as metal prices dropped, then that those uh, those numbers have been changing. Yeah, and, so it's uh, very understandable. Uh, all that would suggest, that was, that, that, 
all that would suggest to you is only buy back stock, okay, if with a sharp pencil you are convinced the stock is very undervalued. You know, if, if you're not convinced it's very undervalued, you're better off just returning the money through the form of dividends. Yeah, Lee, I, I appreciate that, and we, we concur. And and that was one of the reasons as well. It's definitely the intrinsic value my can't talk. Was, was not where uh, the share price did not reflect that. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, in order to ask a question, you do need to press star one on your telephone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude. Sorry, we do have a question from Jim Young with West Family Investments. Jim, your line's open. <laughs> yeah, hi. A, a couple of questions for you. Number one, um, <coughs> following up on the, on the cost, that uh, was raised earlier. Can you give us a sense as to on page eight of your corporate presentation that you have up on the on the web, your the expectation for 2020 cost guidance, all in sustaining costs, are dramatically below what you reported in the fourth quarter and in 2008 in 2019. And the question is, assuming the current production levels hold, your production guidance holds. Um, I would assume that also that the TCs and RCs that you mentioned were in, had increased, but that was already built into these expectations for your guidance as to how confident are you that you can still drive costs and the all in sustaining cost down to 77 cents at Garacocha, $1.75 at Bolivar, and 1518 at Cousy. Thank you. Hi, hi, Jim. Thanks for your question. And, and yes, the TCs and RCs were built in already into the the cash costs and all in sustaining costs that were included in the guidance. And uh, and we uh, prior to the COVID nineteen pandemic, yes, we were we were very confident that we could hit those numbers. Um, and, and as well, we we had our our throughput expansion uh, in place as well, which which will help reduce your uh, your fixed unit costs. So definitely we were confident that we could get there. Okay, so Adam, what I'm hearing is that uh, as long as your production guidance is able to be maintained, the cost should decline quite dramatically in 2020. Based on the guidance provided, yes. If, if this COVID-19 situation didn't happen, that, that is correct. And if if, uh, you know, a, a great example of that, Jim, was um, in terms of production at Yaracocha last year, we, we had an illegal strike that took 24 days offline of production, and Yaracocha still managed to come back and, and, uh, and meet its production targets. So uh, we'll see how long this lasts, but... Um, if again, I think we'll be in a better position in May when we update our Q1, uh, when we issue our Q1 results, and we'll provide better better guidance at that time. Okay. The, the second question is regarding your gold production. In the last two years, and <laughs> your production, um, your gold production has basically doubled in ounces. And the question is, is uh, a lot of is the outlook for gold production continuing at the at the prior rate, or can you give us a sense as to what you think that gold, how the what the gold production outlook is like over the next couple of years? Thank you. Um, is that the, the go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Just just in terms of where we were in 20, uh, 2019 to 2020, we're expecting a 10 to 15 percent increase in in gold production. But again, it, it's 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 not uh, significant in terms of ounces. Uh, we we'll go from approximately uh, eleven thousand to to just over twelve thousand ounces. That's what was guided. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the the gold production uh, is coming. The increase in gold production is coming mainly from both the uh, west. In, in, uh, in Mexico, and uh, 
uh, as, as, as you can see, uh, in the last quarter of 2019, we averaged uh, 40, 42.50 pounds per day. Our target for this year uh, in the first quarter of uh, uh, 2020 uh, was 4,500. And we're, we're very close to, to, to that number. And, and, and with that additional, and then the, the percentage of uh, ore coming from Bolivar West is now at uh, close to 50%. And, and so that, that's what is making the, the, the impact on, on, on gold production. So we, we expect to, to stay at, at that uh, group of rate. And, and even increase it further as we approach uh, second and third quarters in, in 2020. And of course, that will drive uh, some additional gold production from Bolivia. Okay, and then my last question is, although, and I would agree with the, um, the action to, to not go forward with the share buyback program at this time, given the uncertainties in the environment and the like, but the question is, from a, the manager's ability to buy stock, can you share with us when your blackout period ends and how long the window is open for giving you as the senior management team an opportunity to buy stock yourself in the market? Okay. The, the, the blackout period will end after this, uh, after the conference, after, after we, it's, it's ended now uh, once we release our year-end results, and we'll go back into to, um, a blackout uh, just before a month before releasing our Q, uh, Q1 results. So it's a, it's a small window. So basically you've got about uh, two weeks or so because if the, the first quarter results, I mean, we're already at March 31st, so... They're going to be released what by middle of the uh, middle of May. Right. So that gives you basically about two weeks. That's correct. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude the Q and A period. I'll now turn things back over to Mike McAllister for any closing remarks. Thank you, operator. That concludes today's call. On behalf of the management team, I'd like to, I would like to thank the participants for joining us today. I want to be bigger than 100, but you'll come back to me. Yeah, okay. And this is the June 3000. Operator, can you mute the other line? Certainly. Sorry about that. Everybody's muted. Concludes today's call. On behalf of the management team, I would like to thank the participants for joining us today. A replay of the webcast and materials can be found on our website. If there are any further questions or concerns, you may reach out to us at any time after today's call. Our contact information can be found in today's presentation as well as on the company's website. Operator, please conclude the call. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.